of God this morning. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. I was thinking about the fact that we are coming upon a new year tomorrow. Hard to believe. 2023 is already pretty much behind us. Mm -hmm. And if you think toward a new year, often people make New Year's resolutions or at least uh, have some goals, some desires they want to uh, see, you know, things they want to accomplish in a new year. And also I was thinking about, um, as we look into a new year in front of us, what God wants to do in our hearts in regards to his promises to us. And we're going to look at that some here this morning. Let's begin by reading our, our text here, Hebrews chapter 6, and we'll read verses 10 through 15. The Bible says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have shown toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Let's look to the Lord and ask his help in this time of looking into his word. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible that shows us your heart and your will for us. And please guide in this message this morning that uh, your, your power will overrule here. You would speak to our hearts and help to be said just what you want to be said this morning, that your word would speak through your Holy Spirit. And thank you that you have promised to be our teacher. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I think we can all think of times, I think this has all happened uh, to each of us at one time or another, a uh, time that we forgot to acknowledge something that somebody uh, did for us, or maybe we neglected to thank them, maybe not on purpose, but just uh, forgot. Something somebody did, uh, maybe gave us. Uh, we've all gotten Christmas gifts recently, I think, most of us. And uh, I know I, I tried to write thank you notes uh, after receiving those gifts. And I know we probably all promised ourselves that we would write that note to somebody and then life got busy, or we said, I'm gonna make that phone call, uh, I encourage that person, uh, or just uh, talk to them in person, and then we forgot. And yeah. life gets busy, and sometimes we just, uh, just slips our minds. Or maybe we've been, been on the receiving end of uh, something like that, we did something uh, for somebody, and you know, we got a thank you note, or we got an acknowledgement of that or something, and uh, maybe it bothered some of us more, more than others. Uh, trust that we uh, do do things for people, uh, not to necessarily get something from it, but simply to be a blessing to them. Amen. Nevertheless, uh, it is good to uh, thank people, acknowledge uh, what they've done for us, and it, we do like to get that uh, back to ourselves as well. But regardless, uh, sometimes we just can be forgetful in, in those ways. And verse 10 uh, kind of gives us one angle on that. And verse 10, of course, starts in about the middle of chapter 6, and even brought in the broader context of the book of Hebrews. Uh, we don't know exactly who wrote the book of Hebrews, and we think that it was the Apostle Paul. We're not positive on that. Nevertheless, Hebrews uh, shows very clearly that Christ is better. That's really the theme of the book of Hebrews. Written to Jewish people, of course, who, because of hardship, persecution, for their uh, believing in the Messiah as their Savior, were tempted to go back to the old ways of, of Judaism, back to the uh, Old Testament sacrificial system, the way of doing things that had been um, fulfilled in Christ, who had now come and gone back to heaven at this time when Hebrews was written. They were tempted to go back uh, to their, their old ways. And so Hebrews really, each chapter kind of builds on itself, showing how Christ is better than any sacrifices of the Old Testament, which were simply a shadow of things to come, the shadow of what Christ would do. Chapter 10 talks about that. 
So these people tempted to go back to their, their old ways. The writer of Hebrews is encouraging them to you know, stick with Christ. He's the only hope of your salvation, the only hope of your um, going forward, walking in victory in, in your lives. Amen. So then in the middle of Hebrews uh, 6, coming off of um, knowing that's where he's going with this, he mentions in verse 10, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. We hear that phrase a lot, sometimes in a, in a ministry context, a labor of love. Uh, sometimes you can apply that in other, other contexts. But it seems that these people had been, they were zealous. They, they were doing a lot for the Lord. They were endeavoring to serve Him, even though they were having these struggles. They also knew that God had given them promises. I think that happens to a lot of us. We endeavor to serve the Lord. Uh, we know what God's promises are. Sometimes it's hard to see exactly how that's all going to come out, how God, God's going to fulfill His promises. And if we, we are serving the Lord and ministering to others, is there any reward we sometimes ask ourselves? <coughs> Do I see any fruit? Do I see any results from what I'm doing for the Lord? Do I see results from God's promises? Are they going to be made true in my life? And we're going to look at that today here. I think we all desire to see some certain things happen in the new year. Maybe we are desiring to see someone we know or love come back to the Lord. Um, maybe we desire to see a change in our own lives. We like to see some victory over something in our own hearts. We like to see God help us be an overcomer. Amen. But sometimes we just don't quite see and understand how it's all going to work out. Uh, like it's full of, as it were, shadows or obstacles. We don't quite see the way. And we know God has promised some things. We don't just don't always see how it's all going to work out. The main, main thing I want us to get today is that God's promises are often experienced through and following seasons of patience. And uh, this message were to have a title, it would be Patience and Promises. So we're going to look at three, three truths here today about God's promises. And the first one we're going to look at here is the path to God's promises. The path to promises. And this is the how. We're going to look at the how of God's promises. We're going to look at the who of God's promises. And we're going to look at the when. Look at the three of those. So the first one here, the path to promises is the how. How does this happen? How are God's promises made true and seen fulfilled in my, my life and yours? Look there in uh, the beginning of verse 11. And we desire that every one of you who show the same diligence and uh, so forth to the full assurance of hope unto the end, finishing the verse there. God is speaking to every one of us. God wants this to be true, whatever he's going to say. He wants it to be true in each one of our lives. Amen. Uh, not just even the general whole. Sometimes you read the Bible and you can tell it's speaking to Christians in general, maybe to the church as a whole. God is, God is wanting to speak to us individually here. He has a plan not just generally for us. He also has a plan specifically for each one of our lives, each one of our life stories uh, God has planned out, and he wants to reveal to us what he has for us. Amen. And we don't always understand exactly how this happens, but we know that God has a will, a plan for each of our lives, and yet he's also given us a free will. He's given us the ability to choose uh, many things. One thing we do know is that our, cho our choices are not unimportant in the work of God. We see that throughout Scripture that God had a plan, and yet he chose to execute that through the choices of human beings. We can see time and time again that people's choices uh, sometimes even help to bring about the will of God. Uh, some people believe that God's will, which is kind of a, a, a large, sometimes nebulous thing they look at it as, that God's will is just going to be done. His plan is just going to happen. And while it's true that God is sovereign over all, and that uh, he is going to um, be victorious in the end, um, he's greater than man, he has chosen to use us. He has chosen to work through our choices many times. Amen. 
So our choices are not unimportant in the work of God. And he, he really gives them in verse 11 there a chance to make a choice, to show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. And so he's reminding the people, don't quit now. Uh, even going through some hard things, uh, but don't quit. If you've been doing God's will and God's power, and that's, that's two huge keys for the Christian life, doing God's will and doing it in God's power. Uh, we really can't do the will of God without the power of God. We must have his grace to do it. Amen. So if you've been doing God's will and God's power, keep going in that same, on that same path. Amen. It says there, keep showing that same diligence. Same that you've given in the past. And we understand that we're not talking about simply giving it our effort only. It's our obedience to God's power working in us. Keep showing the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. God wants us to continue pursuing that the entire uh, confidence of expectation. That's what uh, the word hope in the Bible is often pointing to. It's not just, uh, I hope this will happen. It may or it may not, but I just am you know, hopeful that it will. But the Bible concept of hope is a confident expectation that... Uh, God is working. I've, I've seen him do some things. I don't see the whole picture, but I believe that he can work. I believe that he can work in my situation. And I have an expectation that he's going to do something. I'm confident in that. Amen. And we'll build on that more as we go along here. Believing God for more. Uh, he doesn't want us to just be content with where we're at. He always has the next step that he wants us to take. And that full assurance really needs to be part of every step of our walk with God because we, we walk on rugged terrain, as it were, in the Christian life. Uh, we, we still have the old flesh that tries to um, bear its ugly head and to uh, pull us back into sin. We have uh, the world co co constantly coming at us with all of its ideas, its philosophies that are um, against God, that, that are rooted in a, a, a godless philosophy. And we, of course, we have Satan himself. I was working to uh, tempt us. We need to completely believe and rest in the Lord. So verse 12, then, shows us what that looks like specifically. How, how does this uh, full assurance, uh, continuing to believe God, on this path to promises, what, what does this look like specifically? Well, verse 12 says there that... And you notice there's a, a colon there at the end of verse 11, so the thought continues in verse 12. That ye be not slothful. Uh, the word there, slothful, um, has the idea of uh, sluggishness or laziness. And sometimes it's easy to just, just kind of coast along as believers. Yeah. But God says, no, I don't want you to just be content with where you are, coasting along, <clears throat> just becoming uh, relaxed in, in your walk with God. Actually, if you were to look up in uh, verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 5, just one chapter back there, it says, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull. Here, and just the, the word dull there is the same word as uh, the word uh, slothful in verse 12 there. Um, a way of life that God does not want us to have. And especially if we perhaps have been saved for a while, been serving the Lord for a good while, it's sometimes it's easy to just start coasting. But, God wants us to live uh, with the opposite of spiritual laziness. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. God is saying, I don't want you to be spiritually, spiritually lazy. But the opposite of that is to purposely put yourself around people and be a follower of people who are actively pursuing God's promises. Followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And there are people that God wants us to follow. There are people that God does not want us to follow. Amen. And just think about the uh, kind of person that God would want you to follow. What, what kind of walk with God, if any, do they have? Now remember, we're talking about God's promises here this morning, so let's just take a little time here just to do a little Bible study on God's promises. So we know that God's promises are found throughout the Word of God, 
uh, sometimes I, I find encouraging to just look through the Word of God and look for the verses that contain will or shall, those two words, indicating a promise of, the, of God. And we know that there's many promises in the Bible that have been fulfilled, many prophecies given in the Old Testament that have come to pass. Uh, some of God's promises are fulfilled every day as we live for the Lord, as we make decisions of faith, Amen. as we trust and obey Him. Some promises are yet to be fulfilled. We still have yet to see the true, uh, the, the, the complete coming about of them. I can think of the book of Revelation, many promises given there, and other books about what's yet to come for, for God's people, uh, for those who are not God's people, many promises yet to be fulfilled. We know that some promises in the Bible are given to all people of all time, Old New Testament, any time the promises are true. Some promises are given specifically to the nation of Israel. By the way, God has promised that land over there to Israel. And no matter what anybody says or what happens, those promises are still true and nothing can change that. Amen. God still loves his people. Amen. Other promises are given to the New Testament church, to we believers who live in this uh, age of, of the church. Some promises are unconditional. An unconditional promise means that God fulfills the promise regardless of human circumstances, such as many of his promises to Israel. Uh, he's going to give them that land, regardless. Other promises are conditional. Uh, you'll often see these in a form of, if this, then this. <clears throat> if you people make this choice, then I will do this. That's a conditional promise. God fulfills the promise if the people it's given to fulfill their responsibilities. So in the book of Hebrews here, of course, we uh, it was written originally to a Jewish uh, Hebrew audience. Mm -hmm. And so uh, looking at uh, verse 13, is what we're pointing to here, when God made promise to Abraham, of course, we have an Old Testament promise in view there, when God promised to Abraham that he was going to make his descendants as numerous as the sand on the seashore, as the stars in the sky. So we're talking about an Old Testament promise here. Uh, but these truths that we're looking at really can be applied to God's promises all across the board, even to us today. As I mentioned a minute ago, go through the Word of God sometime and look for all the promises of God that you can find. I just wrote down just, just a few here. Use discretion to service. Something like John 15, 7. I can bring it, we'll pull it up in my mind here and actually I'll write them down. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. A promise. A conditional one, by the way. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. A promise. And so forth. James 1, 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life. Which the Lord has promised to them that love him. And the Philippians 4.19, I believe, is the one that says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Wonderful promises. There's so many more that we could talk about. So just a little bit on God's promises. Now getting back to our text here in Hebrews chapter 6, you might ask the question, how do we see many of God's promises? So our first point here still is, what is, what is the path to seeing these promises? Well, there's two main uh, truths here, the way that we see God's promises. And first of all, we see in the middle of verse 12, followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The first way to see God's promises is faith. I think we all have at least the working definition in our minds of faith, mm -hmm. where we trust God based on what he has done and what he has given us, even though we can't see. We walk by faith and not by sight, the Bible tells us. We might boil this down into, when we think about God's promises, when we are exercising faith about them, it's like we're saying, I believe and have absolute confidence that God has spoken and will fulfill his word, even though I don't see or understand. Again, it's kind of harkening back to that. 
Bible concept of hope that we were talking about. I have confidence in the Lord. And you know, really the truth is that when we feel like we can walk by sight, we feel we can see the path ahead of us, we can see around the bend, we can see over the hills, and we say, okay, yeah, I, I can see how this will work out. Yeah, I can go on this path. Yeah, so this will be, this won't be too hard. Uh, it's then that we tend to look at life just humanly, and we easily leave God out of the picture, even as his children. And his promises, we, we don't see as much the need for them, because if we can see everything, why do we need the promises and the abilities of God? Must walk by faith. Also, followers of them who through faith and patience. The second one, patience. Bible often uses the word long suffering as well. Mm-hmm. So faith says, I believe we had absolute confidence in God. Patience says, I am willing to wait on God to fulfill his word, even though I want to see everything right now and want to have every answer right now. And you can see how the two just go right together. I believe God, I'm willing to wait on God. Mm-hmm. And you can't really separate the two. If we just have faith alone, or only patience alone, we can really end up in doubt either way. I say, I, 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 I believe God. I do. Then we have the patience. As soon as we don't see what we're wanting to see, we lose faith. <clears throat> we tend to doubt. If we have only patience, I will wait as long as it takes, but we don't really believe that God's going to do anything. That would also lead us to doubt. Faith and patience go together. So thinking back to God's promises about what we do for him, our service to him, sometimes maybe the things that we do seem to go unnoticed. Uh, people don't acknowledge things that we do for the Lord. And so it's easy to sometimes think, well, let me really notice this, so why, why, why should I put a lot into it? I mean, just, you know, just enough to get by. But God is faithful to remember the smallest things. Uh, God isn't just the God of the big picture. He's the God of the little, minute, minute details. Mm -hmm. He doesn't forget those hours of music practice that you put in to try to get good in an instrument. He doesn't forget that visit that you've made again and again, trying to reach out to that person that that you love or you're burdened about. Those prayers that you prayed over and over for someone, and you, you say, I don't see a way how it's, how, how it's going to happen. And God doesn't seem to be doing anything. I, I know that he's made these promises, and I, I believe he is doing something. I can't see it all. Well, keep praying. God doesn't forget those prayers. And I know even myself, there's, uh, I can even think specifically now about a burden that I'm praying about. And I've found it easy sometimes to slack off on praying because I just don't see a way that it's going to happen. Even preparing this week, God has been encouraging me. Keep on praying with uh, faith, with patience. I want to work. What encouragement and a challenge. <clears throat> Look at verse 12 there again. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I mentioned a little bit ago, what kind of people do you follow? And that could be who do you follow literally? Who do you spend your time with? Uh, who do you listen to? What kind of counsel do you allow into your ear gate? Who do you follow, say, on social media? Social media is huge today. And there are a million and one and more voices out there that want to speak their ideas into our minds mm-hmm. and get us to think and believe what they think. And just because it's on the printed or the screen doesn't make it true. Uh, be so careful uh, on the uh, who you listen to. Make sure uh, that you always line up what you see with the Word of God. Are these people just trying to put out their own ideas out there? Or are they the kind of people that walk with God, have a walk of faith, and wait on God to bless? Are they trying to just make things happen? Are they, are they letting God work? Choose carefully. All right, so that was the how, the path to promises. Now, how about the who? That's number two. The who, the giver of promises. 
seen the path to promises. Now, who's the giver of these promises? You see this in verses 13 through 14. It talks about God promising, making a promise to Abraham. We talked about that a little bit already. Verse 13, there specifically the quote from Genesis 22, which is a chapter, if you remember, where God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his only son. And every time I've read that, I probably think kind of how Abraham thought initially. He gave me this one son in my old age miraculously to become this great nation, and you're asking me to sacrifice him? How does that make sense? Of course, we know that God was testing Abraham to see if he trusted the Lord or if he was going to just hold on to this promise, uh, the very physical promise that God had given him. Of course, we know that God provided the ram, the Isaac, that have to be sacrificed, and Abraham passed the test. And God reminded Abraham after that, that he said, I'm going to paraphrase here, by myself I have sworn that I'm going to uh, make of Isaac a great nation. When we think about the promises in the Bible, we never want to forget who has given those promises. Amen. Second Peter talks about them being exceeding great and precious promises. Promises that God wants us to claim. And who's given those promises? It's all in God himself. Amen. Not some person that changes their mind, but God himself. Who never lies, who never goes back on his promises. Amen. And because of that, there's no reason to worry about whether God will come through on his promises, on his word or not. Amen. He promises he will do it. That's right. So that promise that God made to Abraham, verse 13, look at it there again. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. That verse is intriguing to me. People swear on all kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, make a promise, make an oath, whatever. I put my hand on fill in the blank. And they, they make this oath, they swear, I'm going to do this, I make this promise. Jesus actually warns in the New Testament about doing that, just, you know, I, I swear on whatever that I'm going to do this. He says, it's your, let your yay be yay, your yes be yes, and your no be no, just be honest. But uh, God was making this promise to Abraham, making really more promise, it was this covenant with him for all of time. And because God is God, if he was to swear by something to make this promise, there is no greater than God. Amen. And so because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. It's like God took his own name, and he put his hand in his own name, and he said, I'm going to do this. And what a hard and fast promise that is. Amen. See, God's the very name and character are behind each of his promises to us. And he's going to fulfill his word. He, he's going to uh, honor his name, as it were. He's going to come through. Amen. Because of that, verse 14, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. It's kind of a Hebrew expression, if we look at the, the old Hebrew uh, text of the Old Testament when it was written, and kind of an idiom or an expression saying, you know, blessing I will bless thee, multiplying I will multiply thee. It's like it's emphasizing the truth there. An overflowing abundance is what God is getting at there. I am going to bless, I'm going to multiply, he promised to Abraham. So we all know that people may or may not keep their promises. I think we've all experienced a time where somebody made a promise and didn't actually keep it, didn't actually follow through on it. People's abilities, people's resources are limited. We can only do so much. But God gives promises that we can stand on. His resources are unlimited. And his promises are one we can stand on. Amen. So first, the how, the path to promises, and the who, the giver of promises. One more here, the timing of promises. That's the when, the timing of promises. Verse 15, and so, after he had patiently endured he obtained the promise. So that word uh, after there, it's, it's, a, it's a word of timing. Abraham patiently endured. Many times. Uh, a long time, right? 
God gave him that promise, and it was years before he actually saw the fulfillment of that. From the time that God said, I'm going to make you a great nation, until the time that Isaac was actually, that he was actually holding Isaac in his arms. Uh, he had some, uh, quite a bit of time between them. And in between, Abraham had some ups and downs, some times of really believing God. Sometimes we had a low time where he tried to insert his own human plan into it. A child by Hagar. Of course, we are still reaping the results of that decision today. Lots of time went by with no apparent fulfillment of the promise. But Abraham did continue to believe God. He got through that low time of doubt and weakness. He patiently endured God's testing him when he did have Isaac and went through that testing to sacrifice him. And the Bible says there that after all that time of patiently enduring, after all that time of continuing to believe God through the ups and downs, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Amen. And even then, he only saw, as it were, the tip of the iceberg, just the beginning of the fulfillment of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Abraham didn't leave, uh, live to see the great nation of his son. We lived to see the very beginning of that. And I believe that was enough for Abraham, that he saw God come through on his word. <clears throat> God would do so many things in the generations ahead. And by faith, Abraham did see that, I believe, and that's really a whole other message, how that God wants us to see things that we can't actually see yet, by faith. But he saw God work. And you know, so many times, seeing the full fulfillment of God's promises does not immediately follow an act of faith. We say, yes, I believe you, uh, Lord, for this. I'm trusting you. I'm putting my dependence on you. Uh, that you, I can see you working in, in some ways. I see some evidence that you're going to do something. I don't see it all. And so we're, we ought to be willing to be patient. And it doesn't mean that we're patiently waiting through a time of doubt, thinking, well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see if maybe God does it. Or it's Remember, faith and patience go together. And you know, there's a lot of lessons that God wants us to learn in those, you might call those in-between times, that we can't learn any other way other than going through uh, having patience and having endurance. See, God has a journey that he wants each of us to be on, and I thought of really four steps to this when it comes to really any step of faith or any promise that he really puts on our hearts for a certain situation. So there's a journey first of faith, believing God for what he's, he's going to do. Faith then goes to patience, and we want to wait on God for this. And with that patience, I'm willing to endure whatever comes between the faith and the fulfillment. And then we get to the promise. Faith, patience, endurance, and promise. And that's the path that God so often brings us on. You know, maybe you've been taking a stand for God in some area, maybe with your family or in your workplace or, or something like that. And uh, you've just been ridiculed for it, and it's, it's been difficult. God says, patiently endure. Mm -hmm. And we'll bless that. You've been praying for that lost friend or relative or that backslidden loved one for years. Patiently endure. God's given you evidence that he is working in a situation, but you don't understand how it's going to turn out. Patiently endure. I think often of this uh, personal account, especially dear to my wife, when I'm thinking about these truths. Uh, my wife's grandpa was saved in 2009 at the age of 69, and uh, he, had, he had heard the gospel for decades. Uh, my wife's mom was saved when she was 12, and her dad was saved many, many years later when he was 69. Amen. And my wife grew, grew up with parents and siblings at every meal praying for her grandpa to be saved. Wow. And from the time that my wife's mom was saved and started praying for her dad until he trusted Christ, 37 years. <laughs> and she prayed all through that time for her dad to be saved. I think I'd be tempted to just uh, give up and stop praying. Even after five years, ten years, <laughs> third, almost 40 years. 
kept on praying for her dad, kept witnessing to him. She started to see the evidence that he was starting to soften some of the things of God. And age 69, he clearly saw his need. He trusted Christ as his Savior. And God gave him uh, 12 more years to live for him. And what a wonderful thing. Amen. Patient endurance. That's what we're talking about. Remember we're in the book of Galatians, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. We won't go there for sake of time, but two of those fruit are faith and patience, or long-suffering. So one of the evidence of God working in our lives, the Holy Spirit uh, having control of our lives, is having faith and patience. And again, that ability must come from Him. As we close here, let's just turn to a couple other passages that shed some light on this truth. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 couple pages over. Hebrews 10. <clears throat> Again, building on this, verse 33 talks about reproaches and affliction, the, the things that these people are going through. Hebrews 10, verses 35 and 36. Just um, think about this as we read this in let us soak in. Let God speak to you. Verse 35, Hebrews 10, 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Doing God's will leads to experiencing his promises. I remember the day that I read that verse, it just jumped out of me that. After I have done the will of God, only after I've done the will of God, I receive the promise. Oh, how important the will of God is. Amen. And then right across the page there, probably Hebrews 11.13. 11, 11.13, 11, in the middle of what's known as the great faith chapter. 11.13, these all died in faith. All these, these people that trust in God. These all died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. These people knew they wouldn't see it all in this earthly life, and they didn't. Uh, but they saw God definitely moving in so many ways. Amen. It says they received those promises. They saw them far off. It's like they saw them, but they didn't see them. That's how God works in our lives. And they were persuaded of them. They embraced them. Promises of God. He is working. He promises to work in our lives. He's spoken. He's often working whether we see it or not. Oftentimes we don't see it, but he promises that he is going to do something. That he is working. Amen. If we live by faith, he promises that he is going to show himself faithful. Mm -hmm. So we'll take encouragement in that today, that he will come through on his promises. The question is, will we patiently endure to see them? Let's take our hymn books. <coughs> a song of invitation as we close here, number 429. Four twenty nine. Song is take time to be holy. You know it does take time to quiet ourselves from all the noise of this world and to let God speak to our hearts and convince us of what He is doing and the promises that He has given us. If there's maybe a step that you know God wants you to take, perhaps you'd like to come here and pray during this song or just pray where you're at. You do what God would have you to do. Let's stand as we sing number 429, Take Time to Be Holy.
couple of weeks. And we're supposed to be a blessing from the Word of God. And just to walk with the Lord as we go forward in these days ahead. Amen. Appreciate uh, Brother Frank Dalton and his uh, friendship and, and help uh, here during this couple of weeks. We can close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for this time, the season, as Ron was hearing of your word being yes. preached. And we thank you for Daniel, his wife. We're just grateful for them for coming and filling the need for the church here. Ask your blessing upon them and your blessing on each one here who came to hear your word. We thank you now and ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.